Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Approval of the minutes, the last minutes. Mr. President, uh, I didn't reflect this in the agenda, but there are actually three sets of minutes that you'll okay. need to approve tonight. First set of minutes. Do I have any conversation? Um, sorry, I'll make a motion to pass the uh, work study minutes from August 18th. Second. I have a motion and a second. Jenny, take the roll. Greg Van Leer. Aye. Nancy Levitt. Aye. Chris Gerald. Aye. David Winters. Aye. Tom Pato. Aye. Motion's been passed five to zero. Thank you. Next. I move to accept the minutes from the town council meeting of August the 18th. Second. A motion and a second. Jenny, please take the roll. Greg Van Leer. Aye. Nancy Levitt. Aye. Chris Gerald. Aye. David Winters. Aye. Tom Pato. Aye. Motion's been passed five to zero. I'll make a motion to pass the uh, work study minutes from August 25th. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Jenny, please call the roll. Greg Van Leer. Aye. Nancy Levitt. Aye. Chris Gerald. Aye. David Winters. Aye. Tom Pato. Aye. The motion's been passed five to zero. Thank you very much. Next on the agenda is public comment. Do we have anybody? President, I have three uh, parties that wish to speak tonight. Uh, the first one is a Russell Browning. Uh, please step up to the podium, state your name and address, and tell us what you want to tell us. Hi, my name is Russell Browning. My address is 228 Creekside Drive here in Danville. Uh, I wanted first to thank you for the three minutes that I'm given. Uh, I hope there's no clock running. But So I was going to cover four topics, but when I was running over it, so I'm going to hit one, uh, and that's the Ordinance 11 2020, the fee structure change. It was passed on June 3rd of 2020, and in fact, it actually goes back to Ordinance 26 2019, which was introduced August 5th and passed August 18th. I know you guys are like, what? Why? Well, that's where uh, the law enforcement recordings were introduced at $100. Um, I brought it up with the chief of police, and he referred reference me back to 11 2020 and then when you actually look at it it was passed 26 ordinance 26 2019 uh, so the fee of a hundred dollars isn't based in anywhere it's not as far as I can tell and by reviewing uh, the recording it was just a hundred dollars as a fee structure to um, fix current problems there was an offline conversation that happened you can't hear it and it was just $100. Uh, to me, it shouldn't, at no time, right? The fee should actually be covered by the actual expenses incurred. Uh, and the actual expenses incurred would be someone to actually move it, the recording from where it is onto a disc, the physical disc, and then the chief uh, under Indiana Code 514 3-8 to actually review it, right? For law enforcement sensitive materials. So the chief makes 71,000 a year. Uh, the two secretaries make 44,000 a year. And it should be probably be billed at the quarter and half hour, right? So the ordinance takes into no effect if it's a five minute recording or a 500 minute recording. Uh, while the law says nothing more than $150, at no time does it set a minimum other than direct cost. And I think the council should probably re-review that to actual cost so that anyone that actually needs a law enforcement recording can get it at a normal human being price. And how much time do I have? About a minute. Yes. Okay. So uh, next, I want. Uh, I think the council should start asking critical questions, like you guys did just now in the work study, asking like sidebar conversations and asking pointed period questions. And I bring it up because like when the chief of police and all of them asked for $450,000 for 10 new cars, no one even asked how many cars we have and what the status of the cars are, right? Uh, 
which Jenny probably knows, I do a lot of public records requests. I ask a lot of information. If I can't find it, I'll ask for it. And the, the chief, within, I think, three days, got me basically everything I wanted to know. So it was, obvious, it was obvious why we needed the new cars, but no one actually said, why do we need 10 new cars at $450,000, even though it's being broken down as they come in. And I, basically all I've got. About 15 seconds left. Take down the tree either. <laughs> Only when you put in a sidewalk, take down the tree. Thank you. Next. Karen, I hope I don't uh, butcher your name, but it's, uh, I want to say it's Bimbenek. Thank you. Karen Bimbenek. Thank you. I'm here to speak on Resolution 2621. As each of you who make up the Town Council of Danville took an oath of office to support the Constitution, of the U.S. and the Constitution of the State of Indiana, I request that you honor that oath by implementing measures that would prevent citizens of the community and those utilizing services within the community from the Discriminatory Act of Vaccine Mandates, Passport, and Passports for Everyone. Americans were once able to purchase heroin through the Sears Roebuck catalog. Johnson & Johnson recently pulled their baby powder over claims that it, came, claim, or that it contained asbestos. It was, spent, it was ordered to pay a massive $4.69 billion settlement. Galileo, Aristotle's, um, questioned Aristotle's claim that heavy objects fell faster than light ones. He was the only one. For this, he was fired. Likewise, Steve, jo Steve Jobs challenged ideas regarding people and computers. He lost his job with Apple. Both men were skeptics. They had developed habits of thinking that challenged what appeared to be reliable facts. They understood that testing and assumptions over human authority led to greater understanding. There is much evidence as to why we must use skepticism in both science and medicine. This includes vaccines. Does anyone care to remember the 1976 flu vaccine? So despite media's and big text pejoratives that anti-vaxxers or refusers attributed to those such as myself, vaccine skepticism is not a new phenomenon and has existed since vaccines first came to the scene and have vaccine injuries. A skeptic doesn't deny science. They encourage more science, more information, and they ask questions. Skeptics do not fit a certain stereotype. They are husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, farmers, flight attendants, waitresses, hairdressers, teachers, businessmen, medical professionals at all levels, scientists, clergies, accountants, accountants, even lawyers, and members of Congress can be found among skeptics. They are the voices of all people and need to be heard. They are all essential. You have heard some of what might be in vaccines. I'm sure you've heard the lack of due diligence done by HHS, the FDA, and the CDC. You are aware of the track record of fraud and, criminal, fraud and criminal as well as ethical misconduct of pharma. You've heard of concerns by countless doctors and scientists, all of which I have multiple pieces of data and information on. But have you heard on August 23rd, 2021, that FDA approved the biologic license application for community for active immunization? The CDC definition of active immunity, the, product, the CDC's own definition says the production of antibodies against a specific disease by the immune system. Active immunity can be acquired in two ways, either by contracting the, the disease or through vaccination. Active immunity is usually permanent, meaning an individual is protected for the, from the disease for life or for the dur duration of their life but you'll need to wrap it up. I'm sorry. Well, I'm here not only for the Constitution, but to protect my religious liberties. Okay? That is what the Constitution says. I will end just by this one thing. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, for you are not of God, and you are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Thank you. Do we have anybody else? 
wishing to speak is Ann Johansson. Hello. Just wanted to update you on uh, this weekend coming up. Downtown Danville is going to be pretty busy. So um, we have lots of events starting, starting on Friday. We have the first Friday cruise in, of course, and then a uh, comedy show at the Royal at 830. Uh, with Rick Roberts, who plays Barney in Mayberry Man. Um, Mayberry Man pr world premiere is Saturday evening. Uh, that's at 7 o'clock. Um, but earlier in the day, it's the last farmer's market of the season, and then a Mayberry car show in the afternoon. Um, all the vendors and all the merchants will be having extended hours and special promotions. There'll be a book signing with Gary Varvel at the Gallery on the Square. Um, and then the VIPs roll in at uh, 7 o'clock for the red carpet event um, at the Royal that night. And then Sunday is the picnic on the square. Um, so that starts at 11 and um, lots of fun activities planned. I'm looking for one more judge for the apple pie bake-off if anybody's interested. Um, but we're going to have showings of Mayberry Man throughout the day. So 12 o'clock noon is when you are our invited as a town council. Um, you should have received your official, official invitation. Um, some of you have RSVP'd to me. That's great. You're in. Um, if you haven't, just reply to the Mayberry Man uh, production crew, and uh, they'll get taken care of. Um, the apple pie bake-off judging is at 2 o'clock, so if you're coming to Mayberry Man at noon, then you can stay for the judging. Um, and we'll have a DJ and lots of different activities for kids, and it's just going to be a really fun time. So I have schedules. I'll leave those here if anybody wants them. Do you have any kids judging the apple pie? No kids. You got some eyes that lit up in the audience when you said you needed one more judge, okay. by the way. First come, first serve. Is that a, a you volunteer got, you, back there? You got me, I'm right, Ann? Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. Thanks. That's it. Yes, sir, Mr. President, uh, as a point of order, um, during a work study, the council, uh, by consensus, agreed to strike item A from the agenda. From the agenda. Okay, thank you. So item B, tree of removal request, code enforcement officer. <clears throat> Hi, good evening. Um, so for the agenda, I'd like to come before you to request to remove the tree located approximately at 210 West Lincoln Street. Um, that's at the intersection of Lincoln and Cross. Um, so if you have drove through this intersection, you're probably familiar. As uh, you look to your left, um, you'll see southbound traffic coming down, usually uh, at a high rate of speed, uh, 45 miles an hour roughly as uh, it picks up heading further south. Um, so it's an obstruction. It actually is against a town ordinance. Um, so I'd like to refer you to specifically uh, section 4.8 of the zoning ordinance, um, which is vision clearance at intersections. And I'll just recite that quickly for you. Um, at the street intersection of each corner lot, the triangular space determined by the two street center lines at that corner and by a diagonal line connecting the two points on those center lines that are 75 feet respectively from the intersecting point of said center lines shall be kept free of any obstruction to vision between the heights of two and one half feet and 12 feet above the center line grade. Um, so the problem with this tree is obviously it's an obstruction per the ordinance. Um, so I did include some photographs that I took most recently. Um, that should be prior to that. Um, so that's the approximate location of the tree. Unfortunately, uh, GIS doesn't do a fantastic job of showing. Um, but you can see from a couple of those, yes, there's a tree right there. Um, so one of the further photos, if you scroll down slightly, um, you see there southbound traffic, you see the car. Um, so that's approximately, I, I took a few different perspectives, uh, but you can see not only the bushes, which are also in violation, um, but the tree, you know, if someone's going 45, especially if someone's speeding going 50, um, if someone even sticks their nose out, there's a potential for uh, a traffic incident. And I know in the past that actually has happened. I'm sorry, I don't have the data for you today, um, but there have been incidents there. Um, and one thing that, unfortunately, the uh, graphic does not show 
too clearly um, is that several impacts have uh, occurred at the tree. So it actually is damaged on the trunk. Um, several layers of the tree is missing. Um, and utility companies have come and trimmed portions of it away. Um, so in short, it's got moss, it's partially damaged. Um, there's an argument to be made that uh, it is dying, regardless of the, the leaf growth. Um, and uh, it, in a sense, is just in violation. Is that tree on our property? Is that on the verge? Yes. Yes, it is. Um, I did take, uh, I did do uh, quite my due diligence in researching this as uh, it wasn't clear whether this would be a state, um, state as it is State Road 39 or if it would be our responsibility. So I reached out to NDOT, um, unfortunately to no comment, but I did reach out to their uh, records department and obtained uh, documentation on the project that uh, diverted uh, away from Kentucky Street um, down and across in that connecting portion of uh, State Road 39. And as far as I can tell and as far as any best research from any of the town employees that have assisted me, um, it would fall under our responsibility. Um, so basically I'm just uh, requesting that we move forward. Um, the tree advisory has been uh, notified of the issue in the most recent uh, meeting and uh, they did agree to pass it along here. Now, would that be um, Public Works remove it, or do we get to get a professional tree removal company? Yeah, we would remove it. We would do it? Yes. Okay. How close is it to those power lines? Um, judging from the photographs, it's at a safe enough distance we could probably perform the work without contacting the power company, but that's something more in line with the opinion of the Public Works superintendent. Well, there's the power company right there. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. What do you got, Andrew? Those are lines. So, to refer to that question, um, whichever power company is actually over there has done a very good job at cutting that back from the power lines. So, we would be on the northwest side of that tree cutting toward the power lines, and we should not be anywhere near them when we're in the air. Would it be a good idea to have them standing by? I can reach out to them. I would. Okay. You know, a lot of times I see these trees, they said to fall that way, but they fall this way. Okay. I travel that, uh, that intersection quite a bit. And uh, last week, I had nosed out there to see around that tree. And a gentleman that was on a motorcycle thought I was a little bit too close. And he told me I was number one. So... Uh, <laughs> But you are number one. I am number one. <laughs> I don't think that that's what he was saying when he, when he screamed past. So uh, I'd make a motion that we remove the tree. Second. I have a motion and a second. Jenny, take the... Uh... Greg Van Leer. Aye. Nancy Levitt. Aye. Chris Gerald. Aye. David Winters. Aye. Tom Pato. Aye. Motion's been passed five to zero. Go get your tree. If I could make one recommendation to the council on this is um, I know that the Board of Works may be able to do this job. I would recommend considering at least getting some quotes as to professional uh, tree removal companies just because of the liability issue. If this thing, it's a, it's a large tree, if it goes the wrong way and hits that line and it's our people doing that work, we're on the hook for that repair and I think uh, Councilman Gerald could tell you how much that stuff costs. Um, and that's my only concern. We, if we engage with somebody, then it's their insurance and they're on the responsibility for that. That's the only recommendation I would have uh, for you to consider. I would just first recommend to contact Duke. And that, that could be completely up to you guys. The, the main reason I wanted it, to do it in-house was uh, working with the tree committee, they have funding that they're trying to move forward with their Main Street project. So I was trying not to really cut into that, but if you guys recommend that we do that, we don't want to take the liability on, then I have no problem contracting that. What would it cost to remove that tree by an outsider? 6000 I don't know. I do not have any idea. On local Two grand. Level. You might just contact Duke, and they might send their contractors out to do it. Okay. That's, I will get a hold the, of them. That's the road I would go down. Okay. <laughs> I will try there first and then get quotes after that. Good. Follow Gerald's lead there. All right. 
Thank you. Okay. Keep in contact with uh, Andrew. I've asked him to stay up here to do the uh, parking proposal. Okay. All right. So uh, this is kind of a long-winded and uh, complex issue, as I'm sure you're aware, um, ongoing for uh, quite a long time. So I did go ahead and prepare just a sh moderately sized prepared statement. So I feel uh, bear with me real quick. Um, so several studies and surveys have been conducted over the years regarding potential downtown parking improvements. Um, I've conducted the same over the past year and have come to similar conclusions. Namely, that insufficient parking availability appears to be mainly due to courthouse business involving both staff and the public. Uh, rather than utilizing spaces in the several nearby parking lots, um, they're often in violation of overtime parking along the courthouse square. Um, so this is a problem, and it has been going on for quite some time. Um, some are there for what can be presumed as a full work shift of eight hours um, in the courthouse or nearby, uh, maybe probation department and so on. Um, that's only speculation, however. Um, unfortunately, enforcement of parking violations is both time-consuming and cumbersome due to documentation and record-keeping requirements. So. Um, as a policy, I don't really chalk tires as much because of a, a potential legality question. Um, I know there's rulings in Michigan uh, for said issue. Um, so photographs are usually my first option um, and notifying the uh, motorist. But uh, again, it's kind of a time-consuming endeavor. Um, so due to the nature of this problem, I've researched several solutions um, across the board. You know, increasing inventory was one option. Uh, paid metered parking, which uh, did get a bit of blowback on the survey, uh, but one of which I'd like to present is uh, a product called Safety Stick. Um, it's produced by a company called Municipal Parking Services, um, fairly uh, moderately sized company based out of Minnesota, uh, but essentially what the product is, it's a bollard, um, about three feet tall, um, that's hardwired into power uh, and internet, and um, it utilizes license plate reader technology, which uh, the police department is familiar with. Um, basically, it uh, uses the camera to scan the license plates. Um, so basically, how it would work is um, someone who comes to the downtown square would uh, be in a spot. Uh, the device would detect when they arrived, would uh, take a snapshot photo, and uh, scan the plate, and uh, also uh, detect when the person left and scan another picture. Uh, so anybody that would be in violation of uh, going past the two-hour free parking uh, would then be um, potentially automatically uh, through their dashboard software um, ticketed. Um, this process, it's uh, fairly straightforward and uh, luckily with technology there's not too much involvement on the town end, especially with uh, time and resources. So um, there's still the uh, stipulation that uh, an officer would be available to approve said tickets, um, especially in the situations where you'd have exceptions because um, it wouldn't always necessarily detect uh, emergency vehicles, um, off-duty police, or, or something of that nature that may require an exception. Um, but basically, prior to any sort of uh, permanent installation, there's a trial run um, purely for data collection purposes. Um, that I'm very interested in uh, moving forward with and conducting so we can at least um, get um, a more up-to-date um, set of information that uh, shows us how many violators there are um, and so on uh, because right now it's more of a, a speculation and uh, kind of up in the air of uh, how many there is exactly and how much of a problem it is because uh, um, far back that, uh, that we did some of these surveys it's been a uh, couple years, you know, and, and further and further back, uh, reaching back to, I believe, uh, the mid-2000s uh, was one of the original surveys we had done. Um, so to go further, the, the trial um, itself would be free of charge to conduct. Uh, luckily, it wouldn't require any hardware hookup. Um, the device is done um, with a battery pack, so it's not really too intrusive on the infrastructure and shouldn't affect the day-to-day -day business along the square. Um, furthermore, if we decided to move forward with a permanent deal with the company, um, it's basically free of charge. Um, so the installation 
um, the equipment, uh, the maintenance, and so on would be incurred solely by uh, the municipal parking services company. Uh, the only stipulation with that is, and the, the only drawback is, they would uh, capture a portion of the ticket revenue. So um, our basic deal is to get the flow in and out of the town square and around the town, not to really to make money. Yeah, and I want to emphasize that it's not a revenue collection scheme by any stretch. Uh, really, we want to prevent, it's more of a behavioral modification from my standpoint. So okay. uh, it's more about helping provide spaces for people, yeah. patrons of the downtown business community. Let me finish. Um, so I'm just kind of giving some history here. Right. So um, if we put this machine in, it doesn't cost us anything. It would uh, say $10 as a ticket. The machine would keep track of all the cars around where we decide to keep track of cars. Uh, then it sees a violation, and a officer has to check it off at that time, or does he go back to the videos and checks it off? So from what I understand, um, there's a dashboard that the company provides in a software suite um, that I could log into. I, I say myself as, you know, uh, de facto You'd parking be the operator. enforcement officer. Yes. Um, so I would be able to see the photographs that were taken from the device, uh, the time stamp, um, and the license plate. Um, so I don't know if this goes into maybe a, a state statute or so on, um, requiring an officer to approve said thing. I, I've heard there's constitutional arguments for electronic enforcement uh, devices. I don't know if maybe he has any input on that matter. But so, uh, so basically, uh, this machine would go in. We charge $10, $10 for a parking ticket. Mm -hmm. uh, they take five and give us five. Basically. So that yes. half of it, just say, pays for all their stuff that we don't have to bother with. Pretty much, yeah. Right. And then we do have people now aware of that they can't stay there for 12 hours. And, okay. Is this something that you would have to walk around with? Or no, and that's the that's one of the more attractive features of this is uh, it's basically hands off to the town uh, with the exception of uh, approving tickets. So um, there are a few exceptions where someone on the ground would have to um, actually look into an issue. Um, let me know in the past there's been issues with vandalism, um, and more than correcting an issue, it may be more of a uh, just someone going and investigating and letting the company know if something's happening in particular, and they would then send out uh, someone to take care of it. All right, any comments? Yeah, uh, I particularly don't like the uh, license plate, plate cameras um, and the collect data collection. I think that I think it's really too close to uh, invasion of privacy. So that's my opinion on that. Um, Big brother. Exactly, and there's too much of that going on right now, but that's a different discussion. Um, I've lived in Danville for five years, and I know I, I've heard the parking issue many times. I've been down there both during the day and in the evening. I've never not been able to find a parking spot. Now, sometimes I have to walk a block, but that's okay. I probably need to. So I guess I, if I'm not there every day, all day, maybe I don't know how bad the issue is. Um, but I guess the only real problem I have, I, I don't know that I like the idea of cameras taking pictures of cars, but I'm just one. Blaine, how does a three-foot ballard take a photo of a car's license plate from, I guess, two, two things. Number one, over <coughs> other vehicles. Or, or B, in Indiana, we're only uh, needing a rear license plate, not a front-facing license plate. So how does it collect that data? That's a good question. Um, I'm assuming, and don't hold me to this exactly, I, I wouldn't be well-versed on the technology itself. <clears throat> we have to ask uh, some, a representative from the company. Um, but multiple bollards work in tandem with each other. Um, so I don't know if maybe if you know because we don't use the front facing license plate like some states do um, if ones that are facing the opposite end of the street would then capture said data and it's kind of a accumulation and uh, I don't know if there's like a software back-end uh, AI that kind of 
sifts through the data, it recognizes vehicles. Um, it's hard for me really to speculate on how that works, but I do know that it does work uh, for several um, large metro, um, you know, like just to give you an example, Austin, Texas, Las Vegas, a couple places in Connecticut, Texas, and so on. So it's more of a, a nationwide um, endeavor that has worked well for the company. Um, and I know a few smaller municipalities. Uh, one in particular is uh, in Michigan um, of similar population size um, that has had successes as well. So, you, if, given, if given a 27 space street and one or two ballards, um, I mean, does the company provide you with a failure rate, you know, of what, what they didn't capture? Can they even measure that? Do they even know what they missed? Uh, well, and that's a question for the trial run because every location um, has its own uh, characteristics, both in topography and uh, population density, um, structure of the streets, and so on. Um, they all have similarities, but again, um, they all draw on different characteristics. So uh, I would assume that we would have a better picture once a trial run is established. Um, and then we can have just a better idea of uh, total uh, snapshots taken versus how many have been um, properly identified and so on and in its effectiveness. How long is their trial run? Um, I believe it's over a two-week period. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have an exact day because that's more um, upon an agreement. Um, but it's uh, a number of days up to a month, I believe. So if we adopt this, then you can go home. Get another job. <laughs> well, my, Is, my uh, thing. Are you working your way and, out of a job here? Well, so my. Yeah. Are code violations yeah. for, for Mr. Rout to take care of? I see you're turning red. I, <laughs> I never saw a grown man blush. The, the, uh, to answer the question, the trial period is 15 days. I have a couple of things. Do you think it could use satellite technology? I mean, in, in what regard? I'm sorry, I don't understand I mean to the bounce, question exactly. The bounce the signal from the ball, bollard onto a satellite, and the satellite um, I believe the license plates. The, that's kind of scary. The, I mean, essentially, it, it would work in the same fashion because it's all connected to the internet, regardless. Um, I believe the the physical connection <coughs> is a hardwired broadband uh, like Ethernet cable that goes into the device. So um, a permanent connection mm -hmm. would be under the concrete. Uh, both an Ethernet cable and some sort of power supply cable, so, but it does tie into the Internet. Um, the security question of that, I can bring that up with the company. Um, I'm assuming that uh, security is, is not as much of a concern um, because uh, the main point is a lot of this in the public square is public information. Um, take that for what it is. And uh, I've been doing some research into different ways of, you know, controlling parking and in Naperville, Illinois, they have machines, I think they're sort of like this, but they're owned by a company in Chicago and there's a big push for Naperville. They want to own the machines themselves because there's so much money involved. They're right, taking, and, and taking a lot uh, of money and fines. To, to take you back to that, um, I did also um, research a pay station option uh, for the town, um, but one of the attractive features of this option is there would be no initial investment cost, whereas a pay station, even just around the courthouse square, not including periphery areas along like Washington, Jefferson, and so on, um, it, it would cost the town somewhere between eighty to one hundred thousand dollars, and that's with. Uh, public works doing the installation, uh, so we're not factoring in labor time on top of that. So again, uh, this, this is somewhat attractive based on not having an initial cost. I'm not suggesting that we change the uh, limit to how long someone can park on the square. Outside of that, how big of a problem is this? Are we getting a lot of complaints about parking on a daily basis, weekly basis? Yes, we are. Yes. Are we? Okay. Uh, we're not allowed to chalk the tire anymore? Mm -hmm. That's up for debate. Um, well, what do you mean? Well, that, we let our attorney 
Sorry? Say again. So in, in one federal jurisdiction, not in the Seventh Circuit where we are, um, a judge issued a ruling that indicated that the chalking of a tire is an illegal search and seizure uh, in violation of the Constitution, and therefore you could not do that and do this parking. Now, personally, I have trouble getting there on the logic that the judge did, but that is in a different jurisdiction. So. Uh, the question is, if we go about chalking tires, that's, that's going to come up. Like somebody's going to challenge it because you have a, a federal court that has said that it's an illegal search and seizure. Um, the argument could extend to this as well yes, uh, in that you're capturing so. things. And so whenever you do something like this where you're capturing data and that is how you are going to be implementing it, I would say you need to be prepared for the potential of litigation and fighting that issue um, moving forward. That's exactly where I was going with the chalking of the tire. If chalking of the tire is not wanted, then this camera thing would be 50 times worse. That would, yeah, that's more of an invasion so of privacy. We get it in, then the law says, you know, big brother again. Well, I think, I think the sticking point with the chalk is that you're actually um, – leaving a mark physical it, it's the physical yeah. touch of the of the property whereas um you know in the public square taking a f uh, photograph not as much so um and again my enforcement process um wouldn't necessarily need uh chalk to begin with because uh photographic evidence uh, speaks for itself as well as long as there's a time stamp um, and i've found that to be effective in the past and Blaine, what you're looking for right here is is really to bring these devices in just for the trial period and then we'll be able to v revisit this yes and i think that's the the most conservative approach we can make because again it doesn't cost us anything um, so worst case scenario we run the trial we get free data collection we know how much of a problem it is um, and then we can decide moving forward if we want to still pursue a contract and if not we can still retain that data for further use and and uh uh, maybe uh, re-strategizing what we want to do. Thank you. So um, if they gather this information and say in another town, we don't really have any banks downtown, and another town they found a guy was parking there quite often, and then if they robbed the bank, then they could go back through those things. And if they saw the same kind of pattern with somebody parking in front of the Royal and not really realize they were the popcorn people when we had a robbery, they might be involved in a court case and you know, again, with personal data, get in trouble. So that's the only things I'm worried about. We've got too much information on ourselves already. Um, I have another thought, too. Don't we have a few residents on the square? And does this parking limitation apply to them? Yeah, you touched on an important point. Uh, so there are several uh, apartments above the um, retail space. Um, with that, I'm honestly, it's kind of a... A gray area for me because there hasn't been anything stipulated and I don't have any records of permits on file uh, but given the nature of the situation you know there's not a lot of options for uh, residents of the town square for them to park even in nearby areas because uh, overnight parking is not allowed obviously as well so um, it, I know it's a, a modest number of residents uh, but if I had to put a number on it I think it's about a dozen people and, and the uh, impact area, mostly the downtown area, mm -hmm. uh, the enforcement, to my recollection, was like from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Yes. So we would typically not have a huge impact on those residents in the downtown area to, uh, to begin with. All right, any more questions? Um, does anyone want to make a motion? Mr. President, I'll make a motion to uh, approve this parking study uh, uh, to examine this as a potential solution in the future. Second. Second. We have a motion and second. Jenny, take the count. Greg Van Leer. Aye. Nancy Levitt. Aye. Chris Gerald. Nay. David Winters. No. Tom Pato. No. Motion has been shot down three to two.
Sorry, big boy. <laughs> That's all right. You're going to have to get time. more jobs. You're going to have to <laughs> you know, be able to work for us a while longer. All right. Resolution 25 2021 amendment to the holiday schedule. Clerk Treasurer Jenny. This resolution comes before you to move the town luncheon from Thursday. Um, December 16th to Friday, December the 17th. Okay, any comments? Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we move the Christmas luncheon. Second? Second. I have a motion to second. Jenny, take the... Greg Van Leer? Aye. Nancy Levitt? Aye. Chris Gerald? Aye. David Winters? Aye. Tom Pato? Aye. Motion's been passed 5 to 0. Thank you. Okay, E. Discussions on Christmas luncheon. Clerk Treasurer. Um, Mark was. We're signing. What? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. We're going too fast. Sorry, Mark. I get batteries for your wheelchair. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, discussions on Christmas luncheon. Clerk Treasurer. So Mark was able to secure the fairgrounds for Friday, December 17th. So I think it's just for seeking your guys' consensus to have it at the fairgrounds. Sure. Any conversation? So we're going to have a luncheon, awards thing, and a bar. Any uh, comments? I've received um, communications from the fairgrounds. Uh, they've agreed to waive all costs associated uh, with the rental, uh, with the exception of uh, the requirement for to serve alcohol. Uh, they do provide that we have to have a $250 fee uh, to, again, to serve alcohol at the event. But they're waiving everything else, which is $912 that they're discounting us, which is very nice of them. Okay. Um, I've also um, been in communication with the caterer that uh, uh, did the uh, event two years ago, and um, um, she has shot me a price uh, for 150 people uh, at $15 per person, which is uh, actually $2 off of what she normally uh, is charging this year she gave us the same rate that we had in 2019 so it'd be two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars and then if we choose to serve beer and wine sorry it's an additional fifty dollars for her to get her uh, off-site permit for that he's a pretty good cook I hear uh, yeah I think uh, what's cooking tonight is her email address so take your pick so. <laughs> pretty good stuff okay any more comments do I have a motion? I move that we accept the, the terms of this holiday uh, party. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Uh, Jenny, take the... Greg Van Leer? Aye. Nancy Levitt? Aye. Chris Gerald? Aye. David Winters? Aye. Tom Pato? Aye. Motion's been passed 5-0. to zero. Thank you. I want to make sure I understand correctly. We're doing a um, uh, a food event uh, with uh, beer and wine being optional for employees. Right. Uh, we didn't chat about um, cornhole or cards or that. We didn't really. I don't know how you guys feel, but I know it's a little bit late. Yeah. But there's none of that. What would you like to say? I can see you're ready to. Pounce on something. It's cornhole. I mean, somebody it, could break their finger or something. Um, it, it really, um, from what we did two years ago, and again, um, I'm obviously short-staffed on uh, the person that, that helped put this together last two years ago, but um, we didn't have a lot of takers, as I recall, did we, Jenny, as far as any of the games or 
I think if we kept it more as a an event to recognize our employees, um, as far as you know, uh, years of service, um, sick time. Do you think of anything else? And and leave it at that. And then, if uh, once the event's over, if they want to gather as departments and go do their own thing, then we're all for it. If they want right. so we'll to go play euchre somewhere. <laughs> That's we'll stick said. with what it is. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Resolution. We don't have to sign anything. No. Contract Resolution yeah. twenty-seven twenty-one, surplus property, public works. Good evening. I come before you tonight to bring two items to you uh, to be declared as surplus property. Uh, the items in question are ST seventy, which is the bathroom unit, and then. The former ST-18, which is the burned-out backhoe. Um, ST-70, uh, when I first started here, that was one chief complaint of the employees at DPW. It's a great idea in theory, but with six uses per year and the amount of uh, repairs that have had to be been made to that unit, plus the, the fact that we do need to keep employees there during all of the events, um, has really become quite the money pit. Um, so the first concert, actually I believe it was the Destination Danville this year, I was there during the setup just to see how everything worked on the square, and the handicapped bathroom went down right away. And we, we were not able to repair that. Uh, so then we, we proceeded to use the, the bathroom for... The next three concerts and then this last concert I was actually working and before the concert began of course we come in set everything up and everything was working fine we get to concert time the toilets don't even they don't work um, so it was indicated that it's probably one of the converters in there uh, going from AC to DC, AC to DC power um, so the trailer was actually purchased several years ago for approximately thirty thousand dollars and this envelope here is the number of repairs that have been done on that trailer. Uh, I could read them all off to you, but there's a, an entire stack of them. So we're, we're asking to, to declare that that property is uh, surplus property, and what we will do is we will put that on the auction, just as I have been doing the last couple weeks with a lot of the surplus items that I brought to you earlier this year. And that will have a $2,000 uh, reserve on it, so we'll not get anything less than $2,000. Um, and I, in communication with some lo local companies, of course, we have one more concert on the square, so I'm getting estimates for portable units being taken down there, and I'm actually drumming up some uh, advertisements that this is going to be coming on the auction. These companies actually desire these units because they have the time to work on them. Um, they don't have other street equipment or police firing units that they have to work on, so they have the time and the energy. So that was the first item I have for you. And then the second item that I have is the uh, backhoe that was burned back in March. Um, we've since replaced it. I've come to you with the CERs for uh, getting the financing to replace that, and we've gotten reimbursed for the, the backhoe itself. We got full reimbursement. Uh, it was... I believe $1,500 out of the new equipment budget that we were required to pay over the replacement cost. So the insurance company has already paid us for that backhoe. However, I've been in communication, because it's still sitting at DPW, I've been in communication with them finding out, what are you going to do with this? And Patty, who is uh, the claims adjuster that I've been working with, has told me twice now that the individual she was working with to get the, the numbers off that has shown no interest, has not returned any uh, phone calls as far as coming to pick up that equipment. So she said we can get rid of it. And that's what I'm coming to you tonight for as far as this resolution is to be able to put that on the auction as well with the bathroom unit. And that unit, the cab was burned out, but there's still a lot of value in the equipment, so I'm going to put that as a $1,000 reserve on that as well. So I'm hoping that with the whole fire that happened in March that we can actually recoup all that money and get rid of that backhoe that's just sitting there, and it's no use to us. So that's what I'm coming to you for. Any questions, I'll be happy to ask. Answer, sorry. Do I have a motion? I make a motion to pass Resolution 27-2021, surplus property. Second. 
A motion and second. Jenny, take the roll. Greg Van Leer. Aye. Nancy Levitt. Aye. Chris Gerald. Aye. David Winters. Aye. Tom Pato. Aye. The motion's been passed. Five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Ordinance. Hey, I got it. Okay, ordinance 25 2021 annexation town planner good evening, good evening. Uh, this is a uh, ordinance 25 request for annexation and it was introduced at the meeting last month um, and now it's up for public hearing so um, we'll open it up for any comments and it's also located at uh, okay, 1509 10th Street Public meetings open. Anybody want to say anything? <laughs> meetings closed. All right, thank you. Welcome. Okay. Conversation. No further action. Ordinance twenty seven twenty one. Reduction of speed zone. Mr. President, uh, this has been a long standing situation. Uh, we actually, I did some research. We introduced this ordinance in 2019, um, not to uh, go way back, but when we were the three amigos, um, we introduced that when we didn't have an actual town manager and uh, found out obviously that we needed a traffic study done. Uh, at that time, it was uh, we were unsuccessful in getting the permission to move forward. This time you all did agree to do a traffic study. In the traffic study, it recommends that the 85th percentile, that the speed zone be reduced to 25 miles per hour. And uh, through the MUTCD section 2B-.13, um, if the we can actually reduce the speed zone by five miles per hour of the 85th percentile, so I'm recommending that we reduce the speed limit from 30 miles per hour to 20 miles per hour, which is the request of the citizens that have petitioned us for this traffic study. This comes before you tonight just for introduction. All right. Jay, policy change, town credit cards, clerk treasurer. This is to amend um, 2.19 in the policy handbook for town credit cards to add the wastewater superintendent and it's listed all superintendent positions within the town. Any comments? How big, how big of a change is this? Um, we already passed a resolution adding the wastewater superintendent. We just failed to place it in the policy. So it's it's okay. really not a change other than wording to add him. I have a motion? The po actual policy isn't changing. I'll make a motion to update the policy to allow previously excluded personnel to be included in the credit card policy. Second. Greg Van Leer. Nancy Levitt. Aye. Chris Gerald. Aye. David Winters. Aye. Tom Pato. Aye. Five. <clears throat> Policy change meals. Clerk Treasurer will present. Sorry. This is to update the policy handbook 2.9.2 regarding reimbursement of employee 
meals when they are out of town traveling for conferences and training. This is um, increasing the amount from $35 to 50. And it's not to exceed a maximum daily amount of $50. Any comments? Do I have a motion? I assume that I assume that's within uh, standards. Yes. I was looking at the federal per diem. It's fifty-five to seventy-six. So is that, is that why we're moving it up? Just because, just yes, trying to. Yes, and we haven't changed it in sixteen years. Okay. All right. I'll make a motion to change the policy regarding meals and the per diem. We have a second. Second. Motion and second. Jenny, call the roll. Greg Van Leer? Aye. Nancy Levitt? Aye. Chris Gerald? Aye. David Winters? Aye. Tom Pato? Aye. The motion's been passed 5 to 0. Thank you. Policy change CDL. Clerk Treasurer. And this is to change 2.17 commercial driver's license CDLs. This would allow us to reimburse employees the full amount that they are charged uh, for physicals. We see them, CDL physicals, we see them increasing annually. And um, the last couple of years, employees have had to contribute out of their pocket to the total cost of the CDL. So this will just allow us to reimburse them the full charge. Is there a cap on that? Because they can range, or do we send them to a specific facility? They usually use Hendricks Regional. Okay, so the cost should be the same. Yes. Okay. It's a federal. Okay. No more? Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve the policy change for CDL reimbursement. Second. A motion a second. Jenny, call the roll. Rick Van Leer. Aye. Nancy Levitt. Aye. Chris Gerald. Aye. David Winters. Aye. Tom Pato. Aye. Motion's been passed 5 to 0. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Capital expenditure requests salt spreaders. Public Works, Andrew. I lose weight today. <laughs> Definitely getting my steps in tonight. Uh, so I come before you again tonight to uh, this time to bring a capital expenditure request to request uh, $55,990 to replace three of our salt spreaders. Uh, currently, we have two tailgate spreaders, and one of the other spreaders is going to be in a larger truck. Um, as I alluded to last week, the industry as a whole is moving toward a more uh, liquid-based de-icing and anti-icing uh, method of uh, snow and ice control. Um, and these will allow us to both use granular and liquid at, at the push of a button. We, what it is is it's a, uh, a bladder inside the tank or inside the hopper, so it's a poly hopper. It does not rust. Um, so there's a bladder inside there that we carry the liquid on, and then inside that hopper we can also carry up to two yards of uh, salt or four yards in the larger truck. And so this, this I'm bringing to you uh, multifaceted uh, resolutions on this. So currently our tailgate spreaders that we're looking to change out, uh, they're on a Dodge chassis, and for some reason Dodge will not allow the vehicle to be in gear and in motion when the PTO is engaged. So in order for these tailgate spreaders to be filled up, the, the operator will have to stop the truck, dump the bed to get everything towards the, the spreader, and then drop the bed and then continue on. So they have to keep starting and stopping instead of just continuously going. And then the, the larger spreader is more um, because we are down one truck, uh, ST12 does not have a spreader. So what this would do is allow us to replace that spreader. Uh, and then the spreader that we're replacing in a newer truck will go down to SD12 because it's an older truck. It cannot handle the newer technology in that. But in addition to that, we also partner with the school and provide them with salt on an annual basis. So my desire is to uh, 
use our our current liquid sprayer that we use to de-ice or yeah, de-ice before the storm pre-wet um, and basically give that to the school and I'll come back with another uh, resolution or what I need to do with that but that will allow them to use our brine instead of our salt so with brine it's already active as soon as it hits the ground it's better for lower traffic areas or slower traffic parking lots sidewalks things like that and so gifting that essentially we are cutting down our our salt usage they generally use about a ton to a ton and a half of salt per storm that's equates to anywhere from 90 to 120 dollars a storm with liquid deicer or liquid brine i i anticipate maybe two and a half uh, tanks and we're looking at about thirty dollars a storm so we can maintain that partnership but still uh, we can give them a better product in addition to saving ourselves money okay any comments i have a motion i make a motion that we approve the capital expenditure request for three spreaders second I have a motion in the second. Jenny, please take the roll. Greg Van Leer? Aye. Nancy Levitt? Aye. Chris Gerald? Aye. David Winters? Aye. Tom Pato? Aye. Motion's been passed five to zero. Thank you. Thank you. Again, capital expenditure. Hopefully, you won't need it this one. Um, <laughs> slide restoration at the pool. So, um, I made this request, I think, earlier in the year from the host fund, so I'm just coming back to let you know we're working on all those safety issues that we had at the pool. I don't know if you've seen the pool. It got power washed with 38,000 PSI. <laughs> so, and he also said it was the worst pool he's ever seen. So not good, but it's getting pretty now. So if you've seen it, it's getting its first coat of paint. It's all patched up. Um, he said it's probably going to take another week, and then it'll be winterproof. And he said five years, so I'm – I'm writing that down <laughs> but um, this is one of the pieces the two big slides at the pool you've driven by and seen them they've seen better days they've been there 16 years now and they need some love so uh, <clears throat> we're getting the outsides painted uh, gel coat the outside gel coat the inside buffed out uh, fix the seams and then some of the landing where you first start is starting to crack from people jumping in instead of sliding in um, so they're going to fix those spots and then also put in some padding and rubber stop there. And then the second one is the smaller slide that goes on the play feature that's in the zero depth entry. That one needs to be completely replaced because it has cracks and it's broken away from the mounts and stuff too. So this is the slides request. <laughs> Do you remember what the initial cost was for those slides? Yeah, each slide's $150,000 a piece. Hmm. Yeah. We got a price to paint the tower, the blue part, which that's going to have to be done at some point, $66,000. So I'm going to try to find a company closer. <laughs> I think we just got the I don't want to do that price. I mean, so I think brother. we can get it. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe we could get a bunch of volunteers to go there with one yeah. paintbrush. Yeah, I mean, if we go back to the safety issue, I don't think you want any <laughs> volunteers paint that. <laughs> any ladders and volunteers just don't work together. <laughs> All right, do I have a motion? We move to approve both of these. Or, yes. No, I guess one's a replacement, isn't it? They're both capital expense requests. You can, you can pop them both at the same time if you'd like. Okay. I move that we approve the capital expenditure request for the slide restoration and <clears throat> also item O, the pool slide replacement. Second. <clears throat> we have a motion in the second. Jenny, take her. Greg Van Leer. Aye. Nancy Levitt. Aye. Chris Gerald. Aye. David Winters? Aye. Tom Pato? Aye, thank you. The motions have been passed. So I will be coming back. I have three more things from those safety items that I'll be coming back later once I get some of those things hammered out. But just Is that later tonight? Or no, later no, no, no. Like a couple meetings from now. Because if it's later tonight, there might not be anybody <laughs> yeah, yeah. here. <laughs> We're gone, right? <laughs> but just giving you a heads up because I'm trying to knock all those things out by the end of the year um, so that next year we're ready to go. So, thank you. Hey. 
your time. <laughs> Mark, you want to start with all the stuff? Do my best. Uh, met with the department heads this week. Um, the planning department met with the Miles Farm developer. They're, they'll be filing application for prelim preliminary approval in September. Uh, she's been reviewing a draft form, the comprehensive plan. She's going to be meeting with steering committee sometime after Labor Day. Uh, Redevelopment Commission held a special meeting on August 30th regarding possible purchase of the old Logan gas station property uh, that's been listed for sale. Uh, she's working on a text amendment of the subdivision control ordinance that would require all secondary plat site plan, etc., applications to be approved by the com plan commission instead of staff and preparing a brief RFQ for updating our zoning and subdivision control ordinances. Um, in the planning world, it's called a UDO. So um, we think that's a good fit for uh, the town of Danville as it grows. The uh, water department crew will be reading their meter routes. Uh, Kensington section three, preparing for a pressure test and samples. Uh, Wednesdays, preparing a monthly report to send to item. Uh, for the uh, month of August. Uh, North Washington and Columbia Street is working on a valve repair. Hydrant maintenance is going ongoing and they're waiting parts. Uh, with the help of Will, Madison, Lisa, and Kent, Elliot with Banning Engineering, they're preparing for the proposed clear well project and uh, to address the plan commission meeting on separate September 13th. And um, he wanted to thank everybody who's helped with that project. Public Works, uh, reporting the last section of the cemetery sidewalk on Lincoln Street, uh, hope to be completed by this Friday. Uh, backfilling the square alley, uh, that's some concrete work that's been ongoing. Uh, they're working to complete landscaping of library parking lot, sidewalk project, uh, beginning his fourth auction. He still has individuals retrieving purchased items for previous auctions. Uh, $3,500 to date for items sold on auction. Um, these have primarily been scrap items, and they'll be working on the square this weekend, both Saturday and Sunday, uh, for with the downtown partnership, uh, the Mayberry Man, and the Chamber of Commerce. Fire Department has uh, 1,315 runs for the year. They're up 243 from last year. Uh, the Fire Department reunited with a seven-month-old uh, and his family that uh, were involved in a vehicle accident on State Road 75. And this Friday, September the 3rd, uh, the Royal Theater will be hosting a fundraiser for the fire department to try and purchase a new life pack defibrillator. Wastewater, he uses so many acronyms. I, I don't know, I, I, I ought to make him start spelling them out. He has a CIOA meeting Thursday. I know he told me what it's a regional meeting of, of operators, if I'm not mistaken. There you go. Uh, chemical delivery on 831. Uh, he's been working on plant cleaning, changing clarifier rotation, uh, cleaning the main line on South Morgan Street. Uh, they've cleaned up a pipe yard uh, where people are dumping right across from where wastewater is. If you're down there, you know where I'm talking about. Uh, he's been running the belt press for two days this week. Uh, flushing a main line by CVS, and um, Northwood Haven is starting in with their uh, sewer installations. Parks Department, uh, concert cleanup. Uh, as he stated, the pool's being painted. Uh, he's working on an environmental on the conservation club. He started a hiring process. Um, what are you doing with concert rental use process? Oh, just up. He's updating the rental process, and uh, he's going to, he's assured me he's going to uh, put the fountain up for a test run. So we'll, we'll see where it goes. Um, police departments had a few officers off sick uh, with either themselves or sick kids uh, for quarantine for COVID. Uh, Detective Lean will be having some surgery. He'll be out a couple of days. Sergeant Butler is now off probation. He's been in one year as a sergeant, so he... He has now obtained the merit rank of sergeant, and they helped with the tox away days at the fairgrounds um, and the drug take back last weekend. Our community engagement, uh, Madison's almost done with the interviews, continue to work on educational posts for each department. 
she's working on a playbook and the pop-up post. Um, she's advised that they have posted, they made 22 posts last week on the Town of Danville page, gained 239 new page likes over the past week, and they're at 3,752 page likes. So that's pretty impressive, really. So. Then I have a thank you card from uh, Rhonda Beck, who you uh, awarded a proclamation at the last council meeting. Uh, it was very nice of her to express her appreciation. She wanted to thank all of you for your uh, heartfelt gesture. Last thing I have during the last work study um, earlier this evening, um, you all were trying to decide when you wanted to do your next work study. And so I'm ready to write it down so I can advertise it. <laughs> The 18th, if everybody's okay with it. No. no. Next week. That's old stuff now. Ninth. It's nice being deaf. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting old. I'm deaf. Did you say the ninth? <laughs> so That's what happens when you get old. The ninth. Ninth. You want to do September the 9th, which is a Thursday. I'm assuming you'll want to do it after the Redevelopment Commission then. So what time would you like to start? from? Because I'll need to advertise it. When does their meeting start? Their meeting starts at 5.30. I don't know. It puts on their agenda. We're not sure yet. <laughs> right now, nothing, but it's usually last minute. But we're, we are never more than an hour, ever. Usually it's less than that. So, so we'll just say 6.30 and then stand in the back and stare them down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 6.30 it is. And will I be required to bring food for this meeting, or, <laughs> or yeah. is it late enough in the day that you guys will be okay? We'll grab something. Okay. Well, I saw you shaking your head yes. I, I know. Spaghetti. Um, and then uh, the la very last thing I have is uh, uh, our legal counsel has brought a guest, and I didn't know if he wanted to take an opportunity to introduce his guest. <laughs> Need a technician? <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, Caitlin is gone? Cool. Good honor. And con uh, welcome. <laughs> You'll be required to bring the spaghetti every other <laughs> Mark. Mark, Mark brings back biscuits and gravy, uh, lasagna. They all have their own talents here. Food's very important. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Mr. President, that's all I have for this evening. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. So, around the horn here. Jenny? Nothing, thank you. Greg? I just want to thank uh, Blaine for bringing us a parking solution. I understand it may not be the right solution for... Uh, the council at this time, but I uh, would it definitely encourage Blaine to bring back other additional solutions because uh, there still remains a, a parking issue around the uh, downtown area. I want to thank uh, Superintendent Matt. Um, I had an individual reach out to me with some questions, um, and I was able to turn that individual's uh, concerns over to Matt, and he was able to address them extremely quickly, and I appreciate that. And lastly, the sidewalk on Lincoln Street looks really good. Thank you. Yes, it is. Uh, I want to echo your sentiment on, on what Blaine did. And I, I know it's probably frustrating to do all that work, come here and get told no. But I agree we need to have some type of solution. So hopefully we can make some progress in that area. Um, so on these around the horns, we're allowed to talk about whatever we want to. Uh, so I'm going to take Except some. Except you. <laughs> I'm just joking. So I'm going to take some liberty, and, and frankly, this does impact this community. It impacts every community across Indiana and the country, for that matter. Um, Governor Holcomb today 
effectively reissued the mask mandate in schools through the back door by dangling a carrot in front of people. Hey, if you put your mask on, I won't send you home, even if you're healthy. Um, some of you may know that I've been in conversations with the school board and Dr. Schaefer, and we had a resolution on the agenda tonight that we took off that needs some tweaking. Um, but it, it's really unfortunate that the governor, with his willing accomplices in the media, and frankly, a lot of school boards and superintendent offices around the state have created this need in their mind for masks on children. And I, I know that we can't get into a debate on how effective they are, but um, you know, I could go back to Dr. Fauci in February when he said they just make other people feel better. So anyway, at the heart of this, in my humble, not so humble opinion, I have an 18 and a half year old son and an eight and a half year old daughter, and we send them to school to be educated. I'm responsible for their health and well being. At no point during that 18 and a half years of my son and eight and a half of my daughter did I ever agree to co parent with the health commissioner in Hendricks County. And I'm not trying to poo poo COVID virus because I know someone personally who passed away recently. I've had it. It's, it's there, it exists. But we can never, ever give up our liberty for the sake of perceived safety and security. And the debate could be, do kids have rights? Not all rights are granted to people until they turn 18. Uh, but as a parent, I think I have a right to say what should go on my child and what should go in my child with regard to health matters. And so, for what it's worth, I would encourage the community, if you care about your liberty, um, you need to stand up now. Recently in Chicago, a mother, was, her mother had her child taken away from her because she didn't want to take the vaccine. That's not a made-up thing on some right-wing conspiracy website. I watched the news program in Chicago where they talked about it. And what was really sad, the reporters didn't seem to be bothered by it. And so someone said to me, well, that's Chicago. That's not any Indianapolis or the west side of Indianapolis. But I can guarantee you Chicago wasn't always like that. And if we shut up and sit down long enough, we'll never be able to stand up and speak out. Um, our board has actually been very good. So if they hear me, hear, heard my first comment, I want you to know they've been very good. They've been very open in talking to me and other people. And uh, there are a group of us that are going to be there on the September 13th uh, meeting uh, to encourage them to keep the masks optional and to stop the quarantining and, and the contact tracing and the quarantining because a lot of healthy kids are sitting at home doing nothing. And I can tell you, Firsthand, none of those kids stay home. They get out and do stuff because they're fine. Um, and for those that say the masks are needed so the contact tracing, the quarantining stops, I know of at least three schools, and the only reason I only know of three is because I stopped doing any further look, look on that, but I know there are more who are not doing, they've got optional masks, they're not doing the contact tracing and the quarantining, and last I checked, their kids aren't dropping over dead. And uh, two of those places are private schools. One is a public school. So I don't know. It's, it's a very near and dear subject for me. I'm not a constitutional expert, but I've read the Constitution, which is more than what a lot of people can say. And I think that we are slowly losing our freedoms in this country. And some might say this is a national issue, but it really happens here. This is the foundation of our country. And if this falls apart, then the rest of it will fall apart. So we need people at this level, from school boards to town councils to the general public, to stand up for your freedom. And if you have children, they are your responsibility, not the schools, not the governments. They are yours. And we can talk about kids that don't have great parents and are in difficult situations. I understand that. But we cannot turn our kids over to the government like that. So anyway. Rant is over. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to talk about things to look forward to. Uh, this Friday is um, the first Friday drive-in um, car show on the square. And Saturday, 
is the last farmer's market, as Ann said, and then um, Gary Varvel will be at the Gallery on the Square, the art gallery, which is really nice if you've never been in there. It's a super place to go. And um, Gary will be signing his book from 1 to 3.30. And then the Mayberry Car Show will be right after that. And then the, um, the red carpet event at the Royal Theater will be at 7 that night, which the Royal Theater reopened last Friday. And it's just a little gem. So, um, so we're looking forward to that. And then Sunday on Labor Day, there's going to be a picnic on the square with all kinds of fun things to do, including free ice cream at Danville Dips. And um, so just I want everybody to get geared up and make sure you don't miss any of this stuff. Oh, and they're, this isn't a Danville thing, but they're repairing those great big holes right at the entrance to Subway. That's very nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have. Christopher. Okay, I uh, just like to make a comment and support Dave and his feelings. I uh, too feel the same way. But we'll have something the next uh, council meeting. All right. Claim, Move dockets. To the claim docket. Claim dockets. Second. Everybody in favor? Aye. Aye. Let's have the claim dockets. Greg Van Leer? Aye. Nancy Levitt? Aye. Chris Gerald? Aye. David Winters? Aye. Tom Pato? Aye. Claim dock has been approved, five to zero. Any motion to adjourn? Second. Second, and a motion to, a, everybody okay? Aye. 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 Meetings adjourned.